Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Mark. And uh, Mark, I want to thank you for, uh, in your opening prayer, drawing us, just reminding us of the global church, how um, it's not just us, it's there are people gathering all around the world today. Some already have, and are some, like if you're in Japan, you've already gone to bed, you know, um, but uh, all over the globe today, there are people worshiping God, and we're grateful we have the freedom to worship Him and open. There are so many uh, of our brothers and sisters in the Lord who don't have that freedom, and yet they exercise their faith. In, um, and so thank you, Mark, for reminding us of that. I want to say uh, praise the Lord for Mike and Annie and for Susie for leading us. Uh, in worship once again. Thank you for using your gifts and your talents to honor the Lord. <clears throat> so we're continuing today in the uh, Life of Christ series, and uh, so I thought that today I would bring you, uh, related to the sermon for today, top 10 activities that require faith. Okay, now th- this is a list I made, all right? So if you don't, you don't agree, that's okay. You make your own list, okay? Now, this is not necessarily in order, but top 10 activities that require faith. Here we go. Number 10, bungee jumping. Uh, you can't get me to do bungee jumping. I'm sorry, I'm just not going to do that. I'm, I don't have enough faith in a rubber band, okay? I don't care how big it is. I just don't have that kind of faith. Number nine. Skydiving. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not sure about skydiving. Number eight, rock climbing. You notice that these all have to do with heights. <laughs> Number seven, hang gliding. It looks like it might be fun, but yeah. No, thank you. And number six, flying. Now, I love flying, okay, but it does take some faith. Right? To get that big old airplane off the ground. I mean, I know you space engineer people, you got it all figured out. But that's, that's, uh, uh, it takes faith. So, that's all like general stuff. Now, here's number five for me is uh, letting your kids go to public school. That takes faith. It takes a lot of faith. Number four, eating your spouse's cooking for the first time. That takes faith. Takes a lot of faith. Number three, letting your teenager get a driver's license. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Number two, sacrificial giving. You know, it's not a big deal to give five or ten bucks or twenty bucks uh, if you have plenty of money in the bank. That's nothing. But when you give your last dollar. Now that takes faith. And number one, driving on the 405. That takes faith. That takes faith. Right? So faith. What is faith? In our passage today, uh, Jesus is now in his third year in his, in his ministry. And... Uh, he knows that his earthly ministry is going to come to an end. He's going to be departing shortly. Now, he would eventually get to Matthew chapter 28. And we know Matthew 28, and we know that as the, as the Great Commission. And after the resurrection, he told his disciples, he said, go and make disciples of all nations. That's part of our purpose statement for this church. But along the way, part of his strategy was to build faith in his disciples. When you and I encounter tests in our lives, it builds our faith. He wanted them not only to have faith, but he wanted them to experience 
So back to the question, what, what is faith? We know that James chapter 2, verse 26 says, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. So as Jesus was teaching them to have faith, he wanted them to experience faith. He wanted them to feel it, to, to sense it, to smell it, and to, to taste it. Of course, I mean that figuratively. But Psalms 38, uh, 34, 8 says this. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. I want to be able to taste faith. Not just have faith, but to experience faith. So it took a certain amount of faith for them to follow Jesus initially. Right? You remember that? He said, follow me. And they left their nets, they put down everything, and they followed him. And they've been following him for three years. Now, I've titled this message today, The Dirty Dozen, to borrow from the 1967 blockbuster, the star-studded movie, The Dirty Dozen. Well, the reason I have titled this message has nothing to do with the movie, but I've titled it The Dirty Dozen is because there's 12 of them, and they get dirty. Okay? So it's the dirty dozen. Look with me in Luke chapter 9, verse 1. And I'm just going to read through our whole passage, and then we'll come back and, and study it. Verse 1, And he called the twelve together, and he gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money. And do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And wherever they do, uh, do not receive you. When you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. Verse 6, And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everyone. So, first, I want us to kind of digest these six verses, and then we will come back and make application of it to our own lives. Verse 1 says, he called the twelve together. Now, this seems to indicate that they were not always together. That they had some family business to tend to, and, and they had their own things to take care of, uh, in, in the, but they would come together on occasion, and they would do ministry with Jesus. So, this, to me, indicates that they weren't with Jesus 24-7. So, called and together, these two words are separate in our English Bible, but it's actually one word in, in the Greek. It's a compound word. And it should read, he called together the twelve. Not he called the twelve together. As I said, it's a compound word, and what that means is two words put together to form one meaning. The word together is soon. Um, and it means to join close together. So it's not like, hey, everybody come over to my house and we're going to have a barbecue and some people show up, some people don't show up. This, this is, this is a, a joining together of people in a close-knit group. The word for called is kaleo, so soon kaleo, that, that means to summon, 
Okay, so you have soon and kaleo, to summon, to join together. You put them together, soon kaleo, it means that he summoned them, he called them to come, to be together, to be one mind, to be close, to be knitted together. As he called together the twelve, he, he gives them two things, power and authority. Now, power is the word dunamis. Now, it, this could either mean miraculous power or it could mean physical power. Okay? Uh, some people say that, that this is where we get the, the word dynamite. We get it from this Greek word. I'm not sure. But it has that idea. Okay? It's, it's that kind of power. It's physical power or it could be miraculous power. Authority. Now, we looked at this word last week. Authority is a compound word meaning ek, which is out of, and usi, which is I am. Remember that? Out of his being. Out of who he is. Out of I am. That's the authority that he has given them. Now, question. What's the difference between power and authority? There is a distinct difference. Let me try to illustrate it this way. Authority is a five foot two, 100 pound soaking wet police woman with a badge. And she stands in front of your car and she says, Stop. That's authority. Okay? Power, power on the other hand, is a 400 pound man who is like Mr. Olympia, okay, and he just comes over and he picks up the drive end of your car, so it doesn't matter how much you mash the gas, you're not going to go anywhere. <laughs> the difference between power and authority, God gave them both. Power and authority. Now, this is not use it if you want to kind of thing. It's not, uh, it's not the, you know, where you're, you're leaving uh, to go back to your dorm and your mom puts in, you know, like bologna sandwiches, you know, where it's like you look over there and you go, should I eat it, should I not? It's not one of those like use it if you need it kind of gifts. The word here. That he gave, it means that he bestowed on them. He covered them. He cloaked them with this gift. It became a part of who they are. Supernatural. He put it on them to have. It became a part of them. What was it for? Why would he give them these power and authority, why would he give them those gifts? Verse 1 says, so that they can be over all demons and to cure diseases. Now, he makes an important distinction here between demons and diseases. And I'm glad that he did that because there's some in this world that think that if you have a disease, it's because of a demon. And that's not always the case. There are distinct problems. They're separate. They're different. They're separate problems. And they're not to be identified as one problem. So he calls them together and he gives them power and authority over demons and diseases. For what? What's the, what's the mission? Verse 2, he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. That's the mission. The word sent here is apostello. It too is a compound word. Apo is away. Stello is sent. So you put that together and you get sent 
away. You can't be apostello. You can't be, this is where we get the word apostle. And you can't be an apostle and stay at home. You can't be sent by God and sit in your living room. The very word go in the Great Commission tells us that we got to go. We, think we can't sit at home and wait for things to happen. They couldn't stay there. They couldn't stay where they were and be sent. They had to go in order to fulfill their commission. So what was he sending them out to do? He's sending them out to proclaim the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was the subject here. You know, it's interesting. The kingdom of God, it was the topic of the first and last sermon of Jesus. If you read through the parables, most of the parables are about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. That's why you and I are here, is to proclaim the kingdom of God. And oh, by the way, verse 3, And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, And do not have two tunics. Now let me ask you this. When you decide to go on a trip, what's the first thing you do? The first thing you do is you plan the trip. Right? How many days am I going to take off? Or how many days do I have off? How long is it going to take for me to get there? I mean, that's like a like a road trip, if you're taking a road trip, you gas up the car, you change the oil, you make sure that everything's ready, you kick the tires, and you get yourself ready to go on that trip. Some of you, you make a list of things you need, right? I'm not a list person. Um, I make a list, and then I forget where I put the list. And I make, and then, but my, I, I, I'm, my daughter makes a list. She, makes, she loves lists. And she makes lists, and then she makes lists of lists. Uh, I'm not a list person, but at least you plan, and you, and you make sure that you're fueled up, and you make sure that you have your, uh, your spending money and your snacks, and you have all that. Even if you're going on a short hiking trip, what do you do? You make sure that you have the right shoes on. I mean, You do not want to go hiking in sandals, right? You don't want to do that. So you put the right shoes on. You make sure you have plenty of water and bear spray, right? I mean, that's what you do when you go on a hiking trip. Makes sense to do that, right? But here, Jesus says, don't take anything with you. Why? Well, the point of all this is it's not to focus on things that you might need, but rather to trust in God for all your needs. That's what he was wanting them to do on this occasion. Now, to be clear, this is not a universal command. A universal command would be like that in Matthew 28 when he says, go and make disciples. That command is for everyone. This command is a specific command to the twelve for that time. So it doesn't mean that you have to go without anything if you're going to be a missionary. That's not what that means. How do I know that? Well, If you look at Luke chapter 22, verse 35, here's what it says. And he said to them, When I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, Nothing. He said to them, But now let let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack. 
And let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. So you see, if what he commanded the twelve in Luke chapter 9 was a universal command, then how do we explain Luke 22? There are dangers in misinterpreting commands. First, don't, you don't want to misinterpret specific commands to mean universal commands. And second, don't misinterpret universal commands for specific commands. Case in point, back to Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations. That's a universal command. But if you're lazy or you don't want to do it, you, you'd say, well, that was, that was a command to them. It's not a command for me. Well, the way discipleship works is they told somebody and they got saved and then they told somebody and they got saved and they told somebody and we repeat that I don't know how many times. Do, do the math, 2,000 years. Okay, And then eventually somebody told you. So you and I, our command is to carry on that discipleship. So we come to verse 4. And what, whatever house you enter, stay there. And from there, depart. What does that mean? So what, would, what they would do is they would be invited into a home, and they, they, he, Jesus is saying, now stay there. Okay? Now, what, what he's saying is the disciples are not to be moving from house to house seeking better food or accommodations. Right? We do that. Well, that church has better music. Well, that church, oh, man, it is grander. That church over there has a really good preacher, not like our preacher. <laughs> I mean, we have that, that church over there, they, they don't talk so much about sin. They just tell me how good I am. We do that. We look for better accommodations. Oh, they got good food over there. They always have coffee. Some have donuts. So he, he wants to make sure, he wants to make sure that they, that they are trusting him and not in their comfort. It also showed that the community that they were not self-seeking. You know, I hear these, these stories of, of preachers who um, go and they, they're guest speakers at different churches. And, uh, they, and they have requirements. They want a certain type of bottled water, and they want a certain type of jelly beans, and some have a, uh, you know, they, they want a certain type of sushi and all that. It's like that's, that's what they need in order for them to preach. Uh, it's, it must break God's heart that the church has succumbed to that. It is self-seeking to want to find better accommodations. Verse 5, And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. This was a cultural sign of rejection. The rabbis, when they would travel and they had to go through areas that were not Jewish areas, they were Gentile areas. When they get to the edge of that town, as soon as they step out of that town, that's what they would do. They would, they would shake the dust off of their feet. It's like, I'm not taking anything of you with me. That's what they're saying. It's a rejection. Paul and Barnabas did this when they went into towns and they were rejected. They did that in the book of Acts. 
Maybe this was a subtle way of treating Jewish unbelievers the way they treat Gentiles. I don't know. Now we come to verse 6. And they departed and they went through the villages preaching the gospel and healing everyone. Now how does all this apply to us? What does this mean to me? How then shall I live as a follower of Jesus in the 21st century? I believe there are six truths embedded in this passage that speak to our calling. Number one, we are more effective when we work together. I believe that. We all believe that. Yet we find ourselves so often doing things on our own. Why is that? I know why it is for me. The number one culprit, you know what it is? Pride. Church members can argue over the silliest Thanks. I went to this website of this, this pastor who did a survey. He sent out a survey to thousands of churches. And he got back. Uh, he asked the question, what, what's the silliest argument you've had in your church? He got back. Tons of response. I just jot, jotted down a few of them. This one particular church. Now, this is, this is stuff that's really happened in the churches. This is not made up stuff. Argument over the length of the worship pastor's beard. (laughs) Fight over whether or not to build a children's playground or to use the land for a cemetery. That's kind of wound to the tomb, isn't it? A church argument and a vote to decide if a clock in the worship center should be removed. That was a timely argument, right? But on, okay. A 45-minute argument over the type of filing cabinet to purchase, black or brown, two, three, or four drawer. Would you call that a cabinet meeting? <laughs> a fight over which picture of Jesus to put in the foyer. As, as if we really know what Jesus looked like. A petition to have all church staff clean shaven. A dispute in the church because the Lord's Supper had cran grape juice instead of grape juice. Business meeting arguments about whether the church should purchase a weed eater or not. It took two business meetings to resolve it. That was a wacky argument. God calls us to unity, not uniformity. You know? And that's what I love about the church. This is the way the church ought to be. That's the way we ought to be. To celebrate our differences. That's why I know I can love NASCAR and you can love cricket. Right? I mean, opposite ends of a sport. And we can be of different color, different language, different persuasion. We can can have all different kinds of ideas and thoughts. And yet, we're unified in the bond of Christ. That's what I love about the church. That's what we need in the church today. Where there is no skin color. You can have different ideas about things and 
and still be a part of the church. Sometimes we argue over the silliest things. There are churches that split over the carpet color. There are churches that split over whether the organ should be on the left side or the right side. He calls us to unity, folks. We must not forget that. The second thing is, when Jesus sends us out, He he cloaks us with power and authority. We don't go on our own. If you do go out there on your own, you're not tapping into the power and authority that Jesus has given you. Miraculous and physical power. And out of who He is, authority. We go in Jesus' name. The third thing is that our mission is to proclaim the kingdom of God. And I think sometimes we forget that. I think sometimes we're more, or we're busier proclaiming our own kingdom and protecting our own kingdom than proclaiming the kingdom of God. And we'd be willing to ally with the kingdom of God and proclaim the kingdom of God so long as it does not affect my kingdom. He tells us to go. We can't be sent out And stay huddled at the same time. And by the way, I I don't mean to step on any toes, but if I do, then it's the Holy Spirit. Going to church is not proclaiming the kingdom of God. So if you're Christianity is merely about going to church. And you're missing something that God has for you. The fourth thing is going takes faith. We have to sacrifice our, our normal comfort. It takes time. It takes resources. It takes reputation. The fifth thing is, not everyone we tell will accept Jesus. That's just a fact. But our job is not to convince everyone. Our job is to tell everyone. It's the Holy Spirit that convinces them. That's His job. Your job is to tell them. And salvation is between them and the Lord. And then number six... When they were called, they went. God is calling you. Are you already on your way? Is that what your life is about? It's telling people about Jesus. Proclaiming The kingdom of God. If you are already going, keep going. If you're not going, will you go? Let's pray. God, thank you for this passage that challenges us. 
to be sacrificial in our fellowship with you. We realize, Lord, that following you cost us something. That it's, it's not always easy. In fact, it, often it's difficult. But it's the best life. It's the most fulfilling life. It's the most rewarding life that we can have on earth. It's to follow you. And Lord, as you called these 12 to go, you call us to go. Find us faithful, Lord. I pray for everyone in the sound of my voice that their answer will be yes. Yes, Lord. I will follow you. I will go and I will pray across the ocean. I will go across the street. And I'll tell people about Jesus. Father, thank you that you empower us with your power and your authority and that we don't go on our own, but we go in Jesus' name. God, give us fruits. Give us fruits this week. May, may souls be saved as a result of the faithfulness of our people to proclaim the kingdom of God. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.